Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 10 of This Week is Live. I'm your host, Raymond Flotat from mxcwn.com. That's a mixdown. So glad to see you all. Thanks for joining us. Got all kinds of crazy stuff going on here today. It was a big, big day in news and a big, big week. Kind of a little bit of a frantic day today because all of our game teams getting ready for the game awards, which are about to go live here in Los Angeles. All kinds of stuff and all kinds of awards, all kinds of new footage from games coming out. So we have stories today on Kirstie Alley, HBO Max, Cinemax, <clears throat> Nevermind, Nirvana's Nevermind, and Wonder Woman 3. We're going to get to that and a brief little story about something that's sitting right next to me that has a way, way, way back in the origins of my life. So let's start, first of all, with some sad news. Kirstie Alley, the famed actress, known most for the TV show Cheers in the 80s, has passed away. Tragically, her family announced that she had a kind of a late discovered case of cancer. There wasn't that long from the point that they found it till unfortunately she passed away in a hospital. She was given a lot of care, but unfortunately it didn't seem to work and she passed on. Kirstie Alley was 71 years old. Now, those of you who are a little bit younger, you may not really know Kirstie Alley or her work. You might be saying to yourself, who's Kirstie Alley? But if you were someone that grew up in the 80s or perhaps in the early 90s, Kirstie Alley quite famously took on the role of Rebecca on one of the most popular TV shows that TV had ever seen at that point in Cheers. She played alongside Ted Danson, and she took over the female lead in the show after, you know, Shelley Long had left to pursue an acting career in Hollywood. So effectively, she was the star of that show at probably one of the biggest times for mass market television. Everyone pretty much knew who she was behind that show. And then years later, she went on to be in another successful show called Veronica's Closet. So Kirstie Alley passed, tragically passed away, 71 years old. Elsewhere, in the world of streaming media, television, and movies, HBO Max and Discovery, which have quite famously merged and all kinds of shows have been put on the chopping block, things have been eradicated or removed as a part of that, are apparently considering, as a part of their new formulated merged state, altering their name. Now, of course, HBO Max is a, the evolved name of what was originally known as HBO Go, which was the streaming platform for the television network HBO or home box office, as has been known for decades. And effectively, Discovery, which has long been a channel and you know a source of learning and information, has their own platform called Discovery Plus. So HBO Max became the streaming equivalent of HBO and HBO Go. That became the home for all online efforts. And of course, Quite famously, everything of, you know, the Warner Pictures movie catalog, all of the DC comic book movies ended up there. And effectively, they are merging all of the content from both platforms. And they're considering rebranding themselves from HBO Max and Discovery Plus to, no kidding, Max, M-A-X. Now, right now, this is a reporting coming from Variety, and nothing has been 100% announced or solidified. But effectively, this is what is considered to be the strongest contender right now as far as what the name of the new merged property might be. Elsewhere, in the world of video games, since it's a video game-centric day today, 300 ZeniMax employees who work in Quality Assurance, which is a subdivision of Microsoft and Xbox and their gaming department, effectively have announced their intention that they want to unionize. Now, there isn't too many instances of unions forming in the world of video game creation. There are a few. And if this one actually was voted upon by the the workers, the QA workers, to become a union. This would become the first time ever within Microsoft that there was a union, and it would be the largest union of video game workers in America with over 300 people. They are calling themselves, at least for the moment, ZeniMax Workers United, and amongst the things that they're interested in are, we hope to secure the following. This is a statement that they made on Twitter. Fair treatment for all individuals and wages commensurate with the value we provide. Opportunities for advancement within the company accountability and transparency, and a voice in decision-making around scheduling, workload, and more. Now, effectively, for those of you that you know are younger or not really used to the role of unions in America, unions are a thing that obviously was worked on very, very hard by a lot of people over the last few centuries in terms of giving a basic set of rules for workers' rights, in terms of fair compensation, in terms of fair treatment. A lot of this comes back to a time when certain jobs were incredibly dangerous, and there was inherent dangers in being a worker at a lot of these jobs and the pay was very low and there's even a more darker history of the comebacks to company towns. Now, in the modern era, video games, which a lot of people play, take an immense amount of time to make. 
those games that you might play really passionately for a week or two and then ultimately you know jettison throw away or sell or just never pick up again in most cases especially with triple a studios there are hundreds if not thousands of employees that put in an ungodly amount of hours to make that game a thing in reality these things don't just happen easily no matter what toolkits or existing systems and software they're sitting upon it takes a ton of time a ton of thought a ton of coordination and of course a ton of programming to make a thing like this happen so ultimately this whole concept of what they call crunch, crunch culture which is that you know the closer and closer a game gets to gold or shipping effectively the world the climate that they're in gets more and more stressful they're working longer and longer hours and this isn't really anything new to the world of games you can go back 20 30 years and you can hear about people working at game companies and how for the last six weeks before a product is gold and goes to ship they basically don't go home you know quite famously back in the early 2000s the studio responsible for gran turismo and there was footage showing you know where they were basically building the game and how most of the developers there had little like curtains under their de under their table under their desk like right in front of here if you imagine a curtain and then when you know they'd spent however many hours working they would just go under their own desk and go to sleep so this has become kind of a rising tide here in America as far as gamers, you know, uh, game programmers, developers in terms of looking for a better package of support and rights, a more normal work-life balance, the kind of thing that almost everybody wants in terms of their own working life. Elsewhere in the world of music, now most people have heard of Nirvana's Nevermind, the masterpiece early 90s album that was the beginning of both the grunge revolution and the alternative rock explosion here in the United States and around the world. The, you know, unfortunate short-term story of a giant rock legend that you know tragically committed suicide a couple of years later now when their breakthrough album happened their first record was bleach it came out on sub pop records and then effectively you know nevermind became their first real real mainstream record on geffen records produced by butch vig when the album came out it famously had a cover featuring a naked baby in a pool uh, you know apparently not really but staged to look like the baby was swimming after a dollar bill a not so you know tongue-in-cheek poke at business trappings of america the music industry the quest and pursuit of you know purity for cash and everything that was the incredible dichotomy of art of a plane crashing into the ground that was nirvana never mind and all of their music at that point and effectively you know the baby that was shot for that photo was a person named spencer eldon ultimately selected and worked upon to bring into this by their parents with the photographer for the photo, uh, you know, for the album cover in mind. And effectively, you know, there's a baby. Baby doesn't really have a choice in things. What the parents have them do, they do. So effectively, that was it for a long time. And then quite famously, even in 2016, Spencer Eldon was very, very jazzed about the fact that he was the baby on the cover of probably the most famous album of the last 25, 30 years and recreated it, not in the nude, but basically as, you know, a teenage boy basically recreated what the cover looked like underneath the water in the pool. And then some years later, apparently Spencer's, you know, uh, how it has affected him has changed in his mind. And effectively, Spencer Alden is no longer happy with this. And then quite famously in 2021, sued Nevermind the estate of Kurt Cobain, the record label, Dave Grohl, Chris Novoselic, and effectively went to court claiming psychological damage, alleged child pornography usage, alleged sex trafficking, and for various variety of very, very, very minutia legal reasons, the case was dismissed by the judge out of hand in a final summary, you know, dismissal essentially saying this can't be refiled this was done incorrectly and the case was basically taken off you know and was never really tried and never really went to court spencer eldon himself has now come through with the you know with his attorneys and has essentially refiled and has filed for an appeal at the ninth circuit court of appeals and is just as before is essentially alleging child pornography as as alleging sex trafficking as a part of the usage of his image on that album cover and you know the the attorneys for spencer eldon are hoping that a, a certain rule called masha's law which allows children that were used as a part of art that could be considered child pornography to be able to sue for damages even decades on from the point since they know what they never had a choice in what was happening and they were obviously a statutory minor for all intents and purposes lastly in the world of film we spoke a lot in the last few weeks about how james gunn and peter saffron have taken over the dc extended universe the, the warner brothers arm of dc comic superhero films james gunn of course famously long part of marvel cinematic universe and marvel studios and is the 
writer and director of the beloved Guardians of the Galaxy movies and a big part of bringing those unusual characters to become giant mainstream hits in the world of film and cinema. And effectively, now with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 just about done and coming out before too long, James Gunn has been appointed, along with Peter Safran, to be the head of DCU. They're basically co-heads of the studio and are basically going to be starting to drive all the beloved DC Comics characters that everyone has loved for 70 years, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash, all those characters that everybody's so fond of into the next generation. Then, you know, depending on who you talk to, I'm not trying to get in a fight with certain fans of certain brackets of movies here, but not everybody has universally liked the DC Comics movies quite on the level that the Marvel Studios movies were. Now, of course, Marvel has made plenty of stinkers themselves. There hasn't been every single movie a five-star masterpiece, but of course, most of their movies are at least critically praised in the positive and typically fans have liked, and especially, you know, going all the way through Avengers Endgame. But then many of the DC films either didn't succeed so well or were critically reviled or fans didn't care for so much. So effectively, a lot of people are looking at James Gunn's role now as a co-head you know, of the studio as being a kind of a reset for what these characters and these properties could be after so many years of kind of middling results. Now, effectively, The Hollywood Reporter has come out with a story indicating that James Gunn and Peter Safran have been working on what their plan is over like a 10-year plan of how to reset the studio and the movies that are ultimately going to be made, the characters they're going to use, and what overarching stories they're going to pursue. And this is all, of course, in terms of how The Hollywood Reporter looks at it and their sources and what they claim. They're indicating that recently, Patty Jenkins, who's been the director and writer for the last two Wonder Woman movies, and of course the first Wonder Woman movie, very beloved, the second movie, Wonder Woman 1984, if you haven't seen it, is kind of a mess, and I wouldn't recommend it if you you know aren't a real huge fan of Wonder Woman in general. The first one was wonderful, pun intended, and effectively was a really enjoyable movie, which was long overdue as far as a female lead in a credible AAA, you know, big budget box office movie. But effectively, Patty Jenkins had come with the script for Wonder Woman 3, whatever that was meant to be, and had essentially, you know, brought it into the studio. And the report that Hollywood Reporter has is that that whatever that she turned in, for at least for the moment, Wonder Woman 3 is halted completely. Now, whether it's canceled or whether characters are being recast or whether it's just this isn't the treatment for the movie that we want. None of that is really known. James Gunn's even issued a statement today, basically not entirely denying everything that's in the report, but indicating that it might not all be accurate. Some things might be as they are. Other things might be totally wrong. Some things we may just not have made up our mind yet. So a lot of people are coming to the conclusion that this is for certain what's happening. According to The Hollywood Reporter, their sources seem to think so, but we'll have to wait and see. Whatever the case may be, much of what James Gunn and Peter Safran have been planning, nobody really knows. It hasn't been announced yet. No official announcements about what's going to happen have been made yet. But I'm sure soon enough, because of course billions of dollars hinge on what's actually going to happen with these movies, we're going to find out soon enough. Now, before we wrap up here, a story and a little programming note. So effectively, this and one more show are going to be our last shows for the year. We're going to take a holiday break over Christmas to be with family and to enjoy some time off. I'm sure like the rest of you, this year has been completely crackers. It has been as insane a year as anything actually has been in my adult life. And it was time for a break. So we're going to have this week's show, next week's show, and then we'll be on break until the first week of January. So we'll be returning and effectively January 5th. Thursday, January 5th, we'll be returning. And then every Thursday after that, the show will be continuing. We'll have this weekly show each time. So for our story for today, I wanted to talk about this little thing that you see sitting right here next to me. Now, as a personal note for me, this is a weird thing about my life. And, you know, it's kind of a thing of like when you think back to when you're young, how much can you really remember when you were, you know, an infant, when you're really young? Now, my personal life there's like a kind of scattering of memories, little things that basically were like, you know, that halcyon kind of like fuzzy glow thing of a moment of feeling, being in a place, interacting with a certain person. And effectively, for the most part, there was a lot of people, a lot of things that didn't really stick. And of course, there wasn't like a continuous chain of memories until I got to a certain age. And then pretty much everything from there was like, okay. The VCR of my brain was recording. But for me, there's a handful of things that come to me when I think back on those moments. The first moments that I realized I was somewhere, I was doing something. 
And, you know, one of them is being at my great grandmother's house. Another was playing with a toy on the floor of the house where I grew up in Connecticut. Another one, you know, essentially being with a certain family member. But the first one, the one that is the first moment that I have any recollection of, the earliest recorded memory that I can draw back on, basically involved being young enough that I was something of a toddler. My mother was carrying me and was, I guess, walking through a video arcade. And she basically pointed me at one of the arcade games that was playing. And, you know, basically I was able to watch that arcade game. And I remember seeing certain images from it and then essentially never really remembered it ever since. Now, of course, as I was young in the 80s, arcade games were really popular and full video arcades were very popular in that day and age. So it wasn't until about 1991 that I discovered that the thing that I saw, that very first memory, was footage from Dragon's Lair. Now, Dragon's Lair was famously animated by the animator Don Bluth, who came famous years later by the movies The Land Before Time and, you know, basically five old, you know, an American tale. And this game was the first ever what they called Laserdisc game. So before DVDs, there were Laserdiscs and Laserdiscs were basically big clunky platters that were essentially, it's essentially the same thing as DVDs or Blu-rays or discs that had data encoded on them, but it was like a big, you know, pancake sized platter that ran on a machine. So this game, Dragon's Lair, was a fully animated game. It's all hand-drawn kind of animation, the way that 80s cartoons and cartoon movies were basically known for being. And effectively, it was all programmed so that you were essentially, with the simplistic controls of up, down, left, right, and just an attack button, you were controlling the character Dark the Daring, and it was just this giant castle full of monsters and other crazy crap. And it was essentially like you were piloting a movie. The original arcade consoles that there were essentially had, you know, the laser disc player inside them. There wasn't much in terms of circuitry inside them. And there was essentially the laser disc player, you know, talking through a TV and, you know, people being able to control Dirk and what he was doing. Now, if you haven't played this game before, it is oppressively hard. It is not necessarily the easiest game. It is beautiful. It is gorgeous. It is incredibly well made. It is kind of silly and ridiculous and the way only an 80s cartoon could be, but it is immensely impressive when you look back on it. This for me is obviously a big part of why video games have always been a part of my life is that for whatever reason, that first thing, that first moment of cognition being seeing this silly little knight running through a castle trying to avoid bats and tentacles and Lord knows what other monsters and evil knights and of course, because it's called Dragon's Lair, a dragon at the end of it. And effectively, that sparked a bit of a love affair in my life in terms of the format, the medium, in terms of what was possible, mostly in terms of escapism, I think, as far as I look at it now in my adult life. But in those days, arcades were plentiful. Now, when I was young, I think I mentioned this in passing in last week's monologue and last week's episode, that effectively, when I got old enough to be able to do anything, to have chores, essentially, my parents set up a system of chores for me, and then I had to do a series of things every single weekend and in exchange for that, I got $5 to go play arcades at the local video arcade, which was probably 30, 40 minutes away by car, if I remember correctly. So effectively, I had to clean my room, clean my mother's car, clean my dad's poker room, and then effectively vacuum the living room at all. And this took, you know, pretty much the entire Sunday every weekend. And for that entire Sunday... I basically working all day doing all those things, which was pretty disgusting in those days. I mean, it was... I don't. I didn't enjoy it. Let's put it that way. As a six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kid, I, I didn't enjoy it. But I got that five dollars, and at the arcade that I used to go to, the closest one that we had available to us, effectively, you got thirty tokens, which was thirty plays. You know, the equivalent of thirty quarters to play arcades with that five dollars. So I would, you know, my mother would take me to that mall where the arcade was, and then I'd be in there all day, just going from machine to machine to machine to machine. I think a big part of what I loved about that era, and of course, at that point when I first started, the the biggest game when I first started going was Rolling Thunder, and then not long after that was the very first arcade, Double Dragon. Double Dragon was the first game that I saw people like really lined up, putting quarters on the machine to you know have a chance to sub in. You know, this is before Street Fighter Two or Mortal Kombat or Tekken or any of those other crazy fighting games that became so like commonplace in the late '90s. But effectively, in this era in the '80s, you know, it was that vintage vintage era of what arcades could be, and everything was just immense creativity. One of the things that I really look back on with a lot of pride looking at that era, and of course there's lots of great video games now, and there's now more ability and freedom in terms of what people can do in terms of video games now than perhaps there ever was, because you know it was 
there's a lot better tools, there's a lot better software, there's a lot better out of the box toolkits instead of having to build everything yourself straight from scratch, there is actually the ability to, you know, have things to use as a foundation in terms of making game. So, but one of the things that I really loved about that time, and for a while there, AAA video gaming got really far away from was just that it was a hotbed of creativity. Everywhere that you looked, there was something fascinating and different. You had Nintendo's punch out over here with like a 3D view behind the fighter. Then you had over here, you know, Rygar and, you know, side scrolling kind of platformer fighting weird, fantastical monsters. You, of course, had the aforementioned Rolling Thunder, which was kind of like a spy ops game, you know. Not to mention there are games like Elevator Action, which was a bizarre game where you basically went up and down elevators and tried to hide in rooms and everything. And also, to some extent, Marble Madness, which was just what it sounds like, a marble navigating from a top-down perspective going straight down. And then, personally, one of my favorites from that era, Rampage, which was essentially playing King Kong or Godzilla and eating and destroying a city and literally eating the humans that you found when you destroyed these buildings. And then, of course, Gauntlet, the four-player game, which was a top-scrolling kind of view at, like, I don't know, a dungeon crawl, and if you wanted to look at it in Dungeons & Dragons sense. Everywhere you looked, somebody was essentially trying to create something fascinating or different or interesting. And, of course, just like going to Las Vegas, it was as craven and honest as, essentially, we're trying to get your money. You know what I mean? Like they wanted your quarters. They wanted you to keep playing. A lot of video games in those days, they weren't necessarily designed to be a thing that you won. They were designed to be a thing that you wanted to keep playing. You put a quarter in, you do some stuff, something interesting and cool and exciting would happen, but then effectively you'd lose and you'd have to put another quarter in to keep going. It was very hard to master these things and the addictive notion of like how they were approached is what kept people coming back. But still, what was great about them in those days there was something of a single serving approach to the way that they existed. You came in, you had money enough to do them or you didn't, you played them as long as you could. And then when you were done, you went on with your life. You weren't there working on these things for weeks and weeks and weeks or crunching for months on end trying to get good on them. You went in and you had as many quarters as you did or didn't have and then you moved on with your world. But it was that part of it, there was kind of a, I guess you could call a transparent honesty in terms of what they were really there designed to do, obviously to get your quarters. There was no mystery in terms of what was happening. But then to the same extent, an incredible amount of creativity, literally inventing the wheel, trying to make these things basically be different and fascinating, which is, of course, what Dragon's Lair, or at least this miniaturized version here that is functional, made by New Wave Toys. But of course, this is not anything what was existing in the 80s. This is just a more recent modern replica in a miniaturized fashion, was basically built to be a different flavor and approach to it. Okay, well, we've seen a lot of people build these engines and everything. What if we animated a whole game and let people pilot the animated game? That's one of the things that made it so special and so exciting. I think in a lot of years and a lot of decades since, not all the time, and I think the last few years have certainly shown a lot of promise where other years haven't, but there have been a lot of years, especially as games have become bigger and bigger budget spectacles, you know, bigger things that require a large writing team, even bigger programming squads, and then, you know, all the trappings and bells and whistles and voice actors and cinema and staging and, you know, bigger than Hollywood movies in terms of production nowadays. Something about the notion of let's just find an engaging and exciting way for this to be interactive got lost. And there have been many times where that big push for big market success, like anything, has hampered what true creativity should be. But in those days, it was about as exciting and it was about as fascinating as anything could be, especially when it comes to the digital arts. That's all for this week is live. Thanks so much for joining us. If you like what you see here or if you've seen this on Instagram or on YouTube or any of the other places that we post these, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitch. We go live every Thursday in the afternoon, usually around 5 o'clock, and then we post these on YouTube a couple days later. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. So glad to see you all. Well.